Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the opening session of the Asian Development Bank Civil Society Program, brought to you jointly by Oxfam International and the NGO IT Center of the ADP. It is really great to see such excellent virtual participation today, and I'm really glad you all could join us today. This session is part of the 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the ADB. We will be spending the next 90 minutes discussing progressive policies to tackle economic inequality in Asia in the post-COVID world. My name is Maya Nirin Bhatt, and I am the Policy Engagement Advisor with Oxfam in Asia. I will be moderating the discussion today. Before uh, we go into the details of our session, I would like to invite Wu Chong Um, Manager General and Officer in Charge of the Office of the Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development Bank to formally a series of events this week for the Civil Society Program. Over to you, Wu Chong. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Myra. I assume you can hear me well. So good morning from Manila. It's wonderful to see everyone here today. And on behalf of the Asian Development Bank and all of us in this uh, development space, I would like to welcome everyone, especially our civil society colleagues who are dialing in from all around the world. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to formally open the ADB's civil society program. and would like to thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity, uh, especially Oxfam International for the invitation. This year, 2022 marks a special milestone in ADB's relationship with, with civil society, as this year we celebrate 20 years since the founding of the ADB's NGO and Civil Society Center and CSO Cooperation Network. Our journey with CSO reflected the need for a stronger dialogue and understanding between the international in institutions and civil society. As some of you would recall, ADB's deep relationship started a long time ago, but 2000 Chiang Mai annual meeting was a particularly important milestone where for the first time, ADB came under significant scrutiny from the CSOs, uh, we used to call them the NGOs back then. To be honest, we were a bit shocked and scared of the NGOs. Actually, we, actually, actually, we were also scared of the media back then as well. It was then ADB realized that we actually might have a blind spot and civil society play a very important role in helping us identify, the, identify these blind spots and make us to be more in, impactful development organization. Over the past 20 years, ADB has opened its doors to civil society and lived up to the promise of transparency, collaboration and partnership that the founding of the NGO Center symbolized. Through this process, we realized that CSOs bring us fundamental driver of change in our, institu in, in our institution to be better. Our consultations with civil society have helped us to shape numerous policies over the years, from anti-corruption to access to information, to ADB's accountability mechanism, as well as informing country partnership strategies. Just this past year, civil society played a crucial role in, for, in the formulation of the ADB's new energy policy and has been integral to the ongoing safeguard policy update consultation. We even had deep engagement with the CSOs at the project level. Personally, my last project um, as a mission leader back in 2003 to 2005, I got to know the real value of the CSO engagement. We worked with the CSOs at the project level, national level, regional level, and even international level because this large hydropower project had to address potentially significant environment and social impacts all around the, uh, the region. I'm forever grateful personally for the help that I got from the CSOs in this regard. Looking forward to the future, we face many important challenges in our efforts to be a more prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. Asia's economies are still recovering from the impacts of COVID-19 and faced with rising inequality that challenges the very core of our mission. Infrastructure needs are greater than ever, spurring us to seek climate-friendly and sustainable solutions. We're also seeing new threats 
for example, the learning crisis resulting from limitations on access to schools during the pandemic. There are also others, such as food security, that we thought had long been relegated to the past. To meet these challenges, we need, to be, we need, we need bold and innovative solutions from all development partners and countries in the region. We need to be better by CS, we need to be better by CSOs asking us difficult questions, challenge the status quo, and at the same time collaborate with us constructively. You need to keep telling us what we don't want to hear and also what we must hear all the time. So please do ask questions to us in, in the future as well. The past 20 years has been a story of increasing collaboration. I hope that we can continue to build upon this foundation. And we look forward to many more years of cooperation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wu Chong, for giving that excellent overview. Uh, there has been a history of collaboration of ATB with CSOs, and there's definitely a long way to go. Um, among some of the challenges mentioned, uh, I would like to highlight that inequality is a collective challenge. Um, it exacerbates poverty and deprives millions of people from exercising their rights to a basic standard of life, health, and dignity. Uh, to add to this, COVID-19 has widened the cracks of the ecosystem, a pernicious cycle of poverty and economic inequality in Asia. Oxfam envisions a just and sustainable world, a world without poverty and inequality. Since this vision is shared by several actors in the region, including government and development institutions, uh, we felt the need to connect more. would like to create these opportunities to connect and effectively work together to address such complex and interconnected challenges. On that note, today we have a very diverse bill uh, to talk about the different measures to tackle economic inequality. We have with us Matthew Martin, who is the Director of Development Finance International. Um, we we will hear from Albert Park, who is the economist at ATB. We will also hear from Dr. Ritu Verma, who is the adjunct research professor at Carleton University. Uh, and after hearing from all our panelists, we will also be presenting some of the questions you might have for them. Uh, we will be using Pigeonhole Live today for our Q&A session, which is a simple interactive mobile website where you can submit questions to the panel of speakers. You can also vote on any questions that interest you. If you're watching us live now, all you need to do is click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page and it will direct you to the session's Q&A. Smartphone or a tablet, you may scan the QR code uh, you see on the screen or just launch your internet and enter www.pigeonhole.add address bar. Next, key in our event password, which is B M N L 55. Once again, A D B M N L 55. If you have any questions throughout the panel discussion, feel free to submit them through pigeonhole. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by the speaker. After the QA session, we will hear from Maria Rosario Felisco, who is the country director of Oxfam in the Philippines, uh, who will deliver the closing remarks to sum up the conversation. Uh, we also have with us today uh, Desiree D from Tofu Creatives, who is putting together a graphic summary of some of the key discussions we have today. I hope we have enough time to uh, take a brief look at it at the end. Coming uh, back to the topic today, some of the government key government policies which reduce inequality are universal education and health services, uh, social protection, equitable taxation, and enhanced labor rights, especially for women. Development Finance International and Oxfam International co-created a commitment quality index to, to trust on these policies and their impact across 161 countries, 37 in Asia. Uh, Oxfam and DFI have developed a paper titled Asia's Extreme Inequalities Building Back Fairer After COVID-19. Lays out a comprehensive plan of measures which could be taken by Asian governments, uh, the Asian Development Bank, and the international community at large to significantly reduce inequality, erad eradicate poverty, and accelerate growth in Asia. I would now like to invite Matthew Martin from Development Finance International to present some of the key findings from the commitment to reducing inequality report in Asia. Matthew, 
Matthew, if you could kindly also elaborate on how the index and the report finds can help formulate a policy response to tackle economic inequality in Asia. I will hand over to you to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Myra, and it's a great pleasure to join you in the middle of the night from London, uh, where it's cold and dark. So I really wish I was there with you in Sri Lanka to be able to be warm and in the middle of the day, but I, unfortunately I can't be. I'm going to, as, as Myra said, present a few of the findings of the briefing. Uh, and uh, I, I've stressed in the title slide that it's also about accelerating Asia's growth. I've done that partly because our current government in Britain has said they want to have a step up in growth uh, and accelerate it dramatically. Well, what work by the IMF and the OECD has shown that actually one of the best ways to accelerate growth uh, across the world is to fight inequality effectively. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, this report and indeed the global report I'm talking about uh, that comes out uh, in, in about a week from now uh, on inequalityindex.org, the website of the report. Next slide, please. So, uh, as uh, Myra already said, one of the key messages of the report is that COVID-19 has exacerbated Asia's inequality crisis, which is undermining growth and preventing poverty eradication. Unfortunately, Asian governments have done almost nothing to combat this rise in inequality and are further constraining their policy choices by using austerity to cut their new debt burdens. A few Asian governments, though, of all income levels, have done a lot to fight inequality during COVID-19 using equitable public services, progressive taxation and enhanced labour rights, especially for women. And they show that fighting inequality to accelerate growth is a feasible policy choice no matter what the income level of your country. And so this paper lays out a comprehensive set of measures that Asian governments, the Asian Development Bank and the international community could use to significantly reduce inequality, eradicate poverty and accelerate growth. Next slide, please. Next slide. I want to start by talking just very briefly about the nature of the inequality crisis in, in Asia. First, looking at income inequality, over the past two decades, there's been impressive growth and poverty reduction in much of Asia. But income inequality is nevertheless high enough to be undermining growth in every ADB member state by between 1% and 4% a year, according to the IMF, and will prevent the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. We can't eradicate extreme poverty unless we reduce inequality dramatically. Uh, looking at the tables below this, you can see that the worst inequality produced by the market before governments begin to intervene uh, to combat it is in South Asia. Uh, and the worst market inequality in terms of country level is in India and Laos. Uh, the worst income inequality after governments have taken the measures which I'm going to discuss, or some of the measures which I'm going to discuss to uh, combat it, is in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Next slide, please. We can also look at this from the point of view of wealth inequality, where perhaps the p picture is even more extreme, in that the richest top 1% uh, of people in Asia holds a fifth of wealth in all countries, as you can see, rising to 44% in Thailand. Uh, and Thailand, Myanmar and India have the highest proportion of wealth in the hands of the richest 1%, whereas New Zealand, Australia and Kyrgyzstan have the least. Next slide, please. So now I want to look at Asia's commitment to reducing inequality. Uh, as Myra mentioned, we've developed an index called the Commitment to Reducing Inequality Index, which measures the policies governments take to reduce inequality and the impact these policies have on inequality. And it ranks 161 governments, including almost all Asian countries. Uh, the briefing which Myra was talking about focuses in particular on 29 of these. Uh, it excludes the Pacific because we'll be putting out a Pacific briefing for a Pacific focused event uh, later this year as well. And it looks at three pillars. Uh, each of those pillars focuses on one set of policies which have been shown by a wide range of research to cut inequality sharply. The first is public services related to education, health and social protection. The second is taxation, how it's structured and how it's collected. And the third is labour policies, uh, labour rights, especially for women and the minimum wage and how those impact on labour inequality. And each of those pillars looks at three different sets of indicators, the policy measures the governments take, how successfully and widely the policies are implemented and the impact that they have on inequality. And then they're combined into an overall score and ranking in the index, with one being the top score and zero being the bottom score for each uh, of the indicators we look at. Next slide, please. 
So if we look, we can use this to look at both how committed to reducing inequality Asia was before COVID and how committed it's been during COVID. How committed before COVID was the subject of our previous report that we produced in 2020. And in that, we found that Asia was somewhat less committed to reducing inequality than the global average and than other regions. And that Bhutan and Laos came out worst uh, on their anti-inequality policies, whereas the OECD Asian countries and Kyrgyzstan came out best. And in particular, it was notable from that that poor commitment to reducing inequality led to Asia being very ill prepared for COVID in three ways. First of all, as you can see from the first graph, uh, Asia, particularly South Asia, had relatively low health coverage. In South Asia, only 56% of people access basic health care. It had low social protection coverage, again, with South Asia doing particularly badly, and only 19% have access to a social protection benefit in South Asia. And thirdly, it had a low percentage of workers with formal contractual rights who were therefore protected uh, against dismissal and uh, other reductions of their rights during COVID. And as a result, many Asian countries had health facilities which were too weak to reduce fatalities. The lack of social protection made extended lockdowns impossible. And most workers had no formal labor protections to maintain their work or income. And as we'll see later in the presentation, all of these factors have exacerbated health and in particular income inequality. Next slide, please. So the next question really is, did then Asian governments COVID response fight inequality. And here, the, the 2022 report is really innovative in being the first to look at whether the global response to the pandemic has done enough to fight inequality. We're finding that Asia is continuing to form about 10% below average in its scores and would have needed to do twice as much to match the best performers in the world, uh, many of which are OECD countries, but there are also other uh, lower income countries which do a great deal better than, than many Asian countries. Within Asia, South and Southeast Asia lag behind the other subregions, but you can see that Kyrgyz, uh, Mongolia and Tajikistan are in the top 10. Uh, I'm only showing the top five there, showing that performance uh, is a, a policy choice and not predetermined by a country's income level. Uh, it's striking that all the South Asian countries except the Maldives are in the bottom third of the index and, and towards the end of the Asian list, which partly explains the inequality figures I just showed you a minute ago. Next slide, please. If we begin to unpack this a bit and look at the different pillars and how Asia is doing on the different types of response that they could have taken. So Asia, um, in terms of public services, has an extremely low score, 0 0.35 against a global average of 0 0.49. And that's particularly true for South and Southeast Asia, whereas North and Central Asian countries and, and OECD countries perform rather well. Uh, the bottom five countries, uh, you can see there Afghanistan, Pakistan, Laos, Myanmar and Bangladesh are in the bottom 20 of our global index of 161 countries and doing only between one tenth and one fifth of what the best performers are doing. Next slide, please. What does that actually mean in practice? Well, it means that uh, the budget allocations and per capita spending are on the different public services we look at are much less than other emerging and uh, emerging markets and developing countries uh, for education and health and social protection in South and Southeast Asia, although interestingly, North and Central Asia does very well on social protection, having had a long tradition of providing uh, widespread social protection to its citizens. And interestingly, during the COVID pandemic, half of those countries actually cut the share of their budget, which was going to health and social protection and 60% cut the education share uh, during that period as well. This insufficient spending is not allowing the poor above all to access services, as you can see from the second graph uh, under the, the, at the bottom of the slide. Um, all the countries on average, uh, and indeed nearly all the countries on the individual indicators are falling well short of the SDG targets for universal access to the different public services, especially on education, where we look in particular at whether the poorest quintile, the poorest fifth of children have access to education and on social protection. And as a result of all of these findings, we find that public services are likely to be reducing inequality by only 5.8% in, in 
Asia, which is not very much, well below uh, Latin America at 8.8 percent. That the best performers, uh, places like South Africa and pre-war Ukraine, are reducing uh, inequality by between 15 and 20 percent through their provision of public services. Uh, and in, in individual countries, it's Mongolia, Maldives, and China and Timor Leste who do best reducing inequality by more than 10%. And you can see the list of countries there, and the seven of them, which reduce inequality really only very marginally by less than 3%. Next slide, please. Let's then move on and look at the tax response. Uh, here, Asia does a bit better, matching uh, the emerging market and developing country average. Uh, four Asian OECD countries are in the global top 10 on this policy, but they could still do better. Even if you're towards the top, you can see the scores are only 0.74, which means they could still do a lot better to get to a score of one. The worst performers in the region uh, either lack or have very low income taxes, uh, which are the fundamental way that countries can redistribute through tax policy or they exhibit tax haven-like behavior. And we've included an index uh, indicator on this in the index because if they ha have tax haven-like behavior, they are thereby depriving themselves and other governments of tax revenues. And that notably applies to Hong Kong and Singapore in the Asian region. Next slide, please. And what that means in practice is that tax structures on, in, on Asia, in Asia on paper, are not very progressive. You can see from the, the graph below that the, uh, lower, the, the top personal income tax and corporate income tax rates are lower in Asia uh, than in other regions. Uh, and that's particularly true in North and Central and Southeast Asia. This is somewhat offset by the fact that VAT, which is a, in general a, a regressive uh, tax which exacerbates inequality is at a lower rate in Asia than in other regions. And also taxes on wealth, and by that I don't just mean taxes on the stock of wealth, but things like property taxes, inheritance taxes and so on, are generally very inadequate in Asia and only provide about 0.4% of GDP, which is a very small part of Asia's total revenue. Again, during the pandemic, only seven countries led by New Zealand, Bhutan and Uzbekistan uh, and by the Maldives, which introduced personal income tax for the first time, actually raised taxes on the wealthy and on large companies to fund recovery from COVID in a fairer way. This is exacerbated then by low income tax collection due to exemptions, tax exemptions for large corporations and the, and the wealthy and uh, dodging through uh, profit shifting across the world. And as a result, tax systems in Asia are actually increasing inequality by an average of 1.4%. Next slide, please. Finally, in terms of the pillars, Asia's labor response, uh, the, the Asian average is well behind a comparable region with a you know, broad spread of middle income and low income countries like Latin America. And it's particularly poor in South Asia, where a high proportion of workers have no contracts or rights. And you can see from the table that four of, of the five worst performing in, in countries are from South Asia, uh, led by India. Next slide. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that there are labor rights on paper which vary dramatically across countries. Uh, Asia has been assessed by, by both uh, the ILO and the ITUC to be the second worst region for union and labor rights ahead of only the Middle East. Uh, and Myanmar, Bangladesh and the Philippines come out especially badly from that assessment. Uh, Asia also performs less well than Latin America and Africa on women's labor rights. Uh, Singapore, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan are the worst here, but many other countries lack adequate uh, laws to, prevent, to protect women against sexual harassment and rape at work. Uh, and there's a wide disparity of performance on minimum wages. Uh, Cambodia, in India and Singapore have no applicable national minimum wage at the moment. Uh, Bangladesh, Kazakhstan and the Philippines have very low minimum wages. And again, uh, performance during the pandemic was not very impressive. 18 of the 29 countries failed to increase the minimum wage with GDP during, uh, in line with GDP during 2020 to 22. Uh, in addition to this, 43% of workers are unemployed or in formal or vu vulnerable employment, which means that they have none or very few contracts or rights. That's lower than other developing regions, but if you look in particular at South Asia, it rises to 70%, which is the, one of the highest uh, regionally throughout the world. 
Uh, and as a result, uh, while wage inequality is only moderately high across the region as a whole, it's very high in South Asia and over 0.6, which is extremely high wage Gini coefficient in India, Nepal and Timor-Leste. And this level of market inequality is far too high for government tax and spending policies to redress or offset, emphasizing the need for more uh, action on the labor front. Next slide, please. So that was just to say that the response to COVID really paid very little attention to inequality from, from Asian governments. There were, as I said at the beginning, though, some really notable exceptions, which I'm happy to discuss more in, in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, for example, New Zealand dramatically increased top tax rates and uh, the leave given to uh, both fathers and mothers uh, when they were having a baby. Uh, Bhutan made its tax system much more progressive through a comprehensive reform. Uh, the Maldives introduced for the first time personal income tax and a minimum wage. So you can see countries at all income levels really making the efforts when they have the political commitment to do so. But unfortunately, that didn't happen in, in a widespread way. And as a result, the, the figures from international organizations are saying, that, including the ADB, are saying that COVID-19 has driven the number of Asians in poverty to 1.4 billion. Uh, at the same time, Asia's billionaires increased their wealth by about 1.8 trillion, about 40% during the pandemic. And inequality, uh, as measured by the Gini coefficient, is likely to have risen by about 8% during this time. On the other hand, uh, there's no doubt that Asia, uh, partly due to its access to capital markets, had a bigger fiscal response to COVID, was able to borrow more uh, than other developing regions and was able to spend 7.1% of GDP protecting its citizens in both health and uh, economic terms. Uh, but the greater access to capital markets also increased its debt. Uh, and debt servicing is now at a very high level, probably higher than they've ever been in Asia, uh, in terms of being double the education spending, triple the health spending, five times the social protection spending, and 16 times climate adaptation spending across the region. Uh, and to reduce deficits and debt burdens, countries are now introducing austerity plans. Uh, four have already cut spending substantially as a percentage of GDP, and 25, the 25 others are planning to do so over the next five years, uh, to an average 2.7% of GDP. Next slide, please. So finally, let me just move on to the recommendations which uh, this uh, analysis generates and begin to show you the types of policy recommendations that you can get out of the index. Next slide, please. I can't see the slide very well for some reason. It's a bit... But I, I can still read it. Um, the, the recommendations essentially we're making are of three types and they're much more detailed in the, in the report, but also uh, you can see exactly where your government does well and does badly in the database, which will go up online uh, on the 6th of October, uh, sorry, on the 11th of October in, uh, in Washington uh, at the IMF and World Bank annual meetings. And we're recommending that countries should have comprehensive national inequality reduction action plans to accelerate their growth by between 1% and 4% uh, and uh, to obviously help eliminate poverty. We're saying secondly that countries must avoid austerity. Indeed, they need major spending increases on education, health and social protection, including care infrastructure, uh, and an end to user fees on those services if they're going to reach the SDGs of universal access to those services. Uh, to fund this, the best way is to use progressive taxation. There are multiple uh, ways that we look at in the recommendations of doing this, raising the top tax rates, cutting exemptions and incentives uh, for the wealthy, uh, making sure that you uh, introduce solidarity taxes on the rich at this really important time uh, of, to fight inequality and recover from the pandemic, and windfall taxes on companies which may be profiteering from food and oil price rises, and introduce or strengthen wealth taxes. And there's also a need for a dramatic improvement in labour rights, uh, especially introduction in some countries or increases in others in the minimum wages, improved rights for women, workers, uh, and uh, maternity and parental leave, and extension of rights and social protection to informal and vulnerable workers. Next slide, please. For the ADB, as, as was said at the beginning of this, the whole issue of inequality is at the centre of, of the ADB's uh, strategy 2030. And if it's going to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific and sustain its er efforts to eradicate e extreme poverty, it seems to us the ADB needs to prioritise uh, reducing inequality in the agendas of all its governing meetings, including the one that's going on at the moment, 
develop a regional action plan with uh, close, uh, closely specified targets and measures to reduce inequality and poverty uh, through free public services, progressive taxation and enhanced labour rights, support governments in bridging the big financing gap that there is to fund the universal uh, public services and establish a robust mechanism to support and monitor the achievement of SDG 10 across the region. And final slide, please. And finally, the international community needs to help as well. Uh, we, here we have five recommendations. The first is uh, that they should uh, be monitoring much more closely uh, the whole issue and setting targets for how to reduce inequality through SDG 10. The second is that they should mandate the IMF, the World Bank and the ADB to, in, to put reducing inequality at the core of their programs through urgent policy measures uh, on universal public services, progressive tax and labour rights. The third uh, is that they should provide comprehensive debt reduction to countries which need it in order to reduce their debt service and ensure that they have enough funding to reach the SDGs. The fourth is that the uh, well, welcome uh, reallocation of IMF special drawing rights, which provided extra financing to developing countries, should be completed and a further issuance happened in 2024. Uh, to make sure that there's more funding, more fiscal space for uh, anti-inequality and SDG spending. And finally, for those countries which need concessional financing, that there should be an increase uh, in aid uh, to support uh, the spending on anti-inequality measures. And we think it's only with this combination of national government, regional and global measures that we can actually begin to fight inequality effectively across the world and ensure that we both accelerate growth and eliminate extreme poverty by 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Martin, for sharing the status of public taxation and labor rights in Asia. Some of the statistics were personally quite alarming for me, particularly around debt servicing and austerity. So clearly a lot, of, a lot to learn from this. Um, and collectively, we have a really long way to go in terms of addressing inequality and sometimes the singular focus on growth can help us lose sight of inequality uh, so, which is why we need evidence like the CRI report in Asia uh, to really inform our work and to see change and thank you for sharing the uh, demands by audience as well by, by the stakeholders as well. Uh, moving on I would now like to invite Albert Park who is the chief economist at the Asian Development Bank. Um, I would like to understand what role is the ADB playing uh, and can further play in shaping policies to tackle economic inequality? And what are some of the challenges and possible solutions for the ADB in steering the conversation on inequality? I would like to hand over to you too. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, what I would like to do in my time is to talk about some of the public policy priorities for responding to the inequality, especially looking uh, kind of to the post-pandemic period. Um, and then also uh, in that response, try to give people a sense of what ADB is doing to address uh, inequality in uh, different domains. Next slide, please. As you know, uh, can, can we really fix the slides? They're very unclear to read. I don't know what's going on. It was the same at the end of Matthew's presentation. So I hope we can fix the slides, the, the clarity. Thank you very much, good. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that you know the ADB's uh, Strategy 2030 uh, outlines seven operational priorities and right at the beginning, uh, consistent with the bank's core mission of poverty reduction is to address remaining poverty and reduce inequality. The second is to accelerate progress in gender equality. And the third is to tackle climate change. Uh, and all of these, I think, are relevant to the uh, inequality reduction agenda that um, is being is the topic of today's session. Uh, I, I really appreciated uh, Matthew's uh, uh, presentation, and I think all of the recommendations for the ADB are very well taken. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one thing I do want to uh, start out by saying, though, is that there has been quite impressive poverty reduction in Asia. So the left-hand figure shows that from 1990 to 2013, 
uh, the extreme poor fell from over 50% to something like 9%. And then in the right-hand figure, it starts from 2015. And you can see that the reduction has continued. And whether you look at the poorest or other groups of the poor, and you see the big jump up after 2019, this is the COVID pandemic. And we estimated that the pandemic set back the progress against poverty by two years, increased poverty by 75 to 80 million poor at the time. Uh, but as growth has recovered, um, we hope that uh, the progress in reducing poverty can continue. And uh, the, we project that it's still possible to reduce extreme poverty to less than 1% and to reduce moderate poverty to 6% by 2030 um, in the region. Now, one caveat is, I think as Matthew emphasized in his talk, uh, the COVID pandemic exacerbated inequality and these projections may underestimate the extent to which that happens. So I definitely agree that making progress on inequality is very important but I still think it's in the context where we are really making strong development achievements in the region. Next slide, please. So in my comments today, I wanna to talk about four priorities um, for reducing post-pandemic inequality. Uh, first is to strengthen social protection systems. Second is to remediate scarring effects from learning loss and unemployment caused by the pandemic. The third is to promote inclusive digitalization and finally, is to think of ways to reduce inequality of opportunity and really increase social mobility. Um, of course, many of the things that Matthew mentioned are also spot on, especially trying to increase tax progressivity. We had a tax mobilization chapter where we described these challenges. This is in our Asian Development Outlook report earlier this year. Um, it's challenging because uh, countries need the capacity to document the value of people's property, even to document who owns what in order to tax it uh, effectively. Uh, income tax, uh, progressive income taxes also require very good information on people's income, which is challenging uh, when there's a high degree of informality. So strengthening institutions will strengthen the possibility of increasing progressive taxation. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to also recognize that um, although there were definitely big limitations to the social prediction systems of uh, countries in the region, as pointed out by Matthew, um, especially because informality made it hard to identify and target the poor. Nonetheless, the pandemic did lead to a really unprecedented expansion and in innovation in social protection systems in the region. So the left figure shows that in many countries, the proportion of vulnerable population receiving social assistance benefits really increased, increased quite significantly during the pandemic. Our estimates, our tracking of social uh, expenditures suggest that social protection systems reached about 40% of the population in the region during the pandemic. Now, despite this uh, progress, if you will, pre-existing challenges remain and there's, of course, this issue of financing or whether it can be sustainable given heightened uh, debt repayment and obligations and uh, the lack of fiscal space in many countries. Um, one thing that the pandemic, pandemic did, I think, is really strengthen the overall recognition that social protection systems are a very important system for the government uh, to be in charge of and support its citizens. Next slide, please. So at the ADB, Next slide, please. At the ADB, we, uh, one thing we did is provide quite a lot of support. Can we get to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we provided a lot of report, uh, re support in response to COVID-19, budgetary support to support the need to help reach vulnerable groups. Uh, you can see um, here that um, as of June 2022, ADB committed $29 billion for developing member countries and the private sector. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that uh, we are doing, um, uh, led by our social development group, is to really think about the strategy going forward, developing a new directional guide for social protection for 2022 to 2030, um, aligning with the SDG's emphasis on the importance of social protection uh, we have uh, been developing a social protection 
a monitoring system and indicator which tracks the amount of expenditures and beneficiaries of these programs across the region. And we should be re releasing a report soon. Um, we also have a number of, number of technical assistance projects to support uh, the strengthening of social protection systems, um, especially the design of the programs, digitalization to improve, improve targeting, et cetera. And we're working with a number of different partners uh, to do this. Next slide, please. The second area I wanted to emphasize is the need to address the learning losses that occurred in many countries when schools were closed. And our research suggests that these learning losses really worsened inequality. So we estimate that on average, uh, lifetime incomes of children who uh, were not going to school re was reduced by 6%. Um, and it was unequal in the sense that on the left-hand side, you can see that if you were a ch child in a poor household, the poorest quintile, your uh, lost learnings were much greater proportionally than if you were uh, in a rich household. And similarly, females had larger lifetime earning losses than males uh, because they tended to be in families that uh, had less access to the internet during the pandemic and the returns to schooling is higher for females. They're also more likely to drop out when their parents suffer income shocks caused by the pandemic. Next slide, please. Earlier this summer, our research department released a policy brief to outline best practice based on all of the existing evidence to date globally on how to remediate learning losses to prevent lasting impacts. And so we recommend that uh, schools consolidate their curriculum to focus on the essential skills, to do many different uh, reforms to match better match teaching to the students' learning levels, to possibly extend instructional time, and to uh, uh, aggressively encourage re-enrollment through public information campaigns and individual outreach to students. Um, this, of course, requires a lot of support to teachers, but we feel this is an urgent task uh, to reduce the inequality impacts of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, the other area that uh, has been a priority for the ADB is digital economy. And uh, we really believe that digital technology can actually promote inclusive growth if it's inclusive, if, it, if, it, if we can cross that digital divide and help entrepreneurs and micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, small firms, can benefit more from ICT than large firms because it helps them overcome large fixed costs that large firms don't have, like having to have physical stores, get access to information, marketing costs, international trade costs. Um, to make digitalization inclusive requires not only to make it accessible, the internet accessible to the poor, but also promote digital literacy, provide very clear regulations, paperless trade, harmonize international standards, in um, our theme chapter to our econ uh, Asian Economic Integration Report earlier this year, we outlined all of the policy priorities for promoting digital services trade. And in our uh, theme chapter for the Asian Development Outlook update that we just released last week, we have a description of how countries can provide better environments for entrepren digital entrepreneurship and for small and medium-sized enterprises. Next slide, please. So at ADB, um, we're incorporating digital technology in all of our different sector and thematic work. And within each of these different areas, uh, there's an emphasis on inclusivity. How can we make these technologies more inclusive? And you can just imagine that there are ways to do this in education, uh, um, using uh, educational technologies or, or remote access to uh, tutoring and other support in healthcare, uh, telemedicine to meet, reach remote areas, et cetera. And so this is a key part of what we're trying to do to promote inclusivity since the digital economy is one thing that really uh, accelerated in its development during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, uh, we want to uh, increase social mobility, this is a difficult task. It requires the types of investments in health, education, uh, employment institutions that were described in uh, Matthew's presentation. And then next slide, please. So one thing that we have done 
is to tr try to support integrated approaches to uh, help lift people out of poverty in a more uh, persistent fashion. There's a uh, something called the graduation approach, which integrates social protection, livelihood promotion, financial inclusion, social empowerment, all of these interventions combined to really um, combat the interrelated challenges that keep people trapped in poverty. Next slide, please. We piloted a program in the Philippines in 2018, and of course the pandemic hit, and we found that during the pandemic, this intervention really did help households with food production livelihoods um, make them more able to feed their own families and supply communities with food when local markets were closed during the lockdown. Um, we note that graduation type models have been implemented in many countries and there's a lot of growing evidence of their effectiveness. We are continuing to support similar initiatives in Pakistan and Mongolia. Um, last slide, please. Oh, I think that's it actually. Thank you for your attention. I hope this gives you a sense of all of the different things that ADB is uh, trying to prioritize in the fight against inequality. Thank you so much, Albert Park, for that really insightful response. Uh, clearly, ADB is a key player in the region and has and has an important role to play in cre creating knowledge, working with countries, and shaping policies. Uh, particularly, the work you highlighted on supporting projects was quite interesting. Um, and it is very important to continue supporting projects that reduce economic and gender inequality. Um, and these could include investing in, like you mentioned, digital inclusive tech, um, other than that, public services, care infrastructure, and social protection. I would now I'd like to invite our last panelist of today, um, Dr. Ritu Verma, who is the adjunct research professor, professor Carlton University. Um, so Dr. Ritu, I have, a, I have lots of questions for you. Uh, firstly, um, how is the academia rethinking economic inequality? And how can this thinking provide a critical view of IFI's approach towards inequality? Um, also, what are some of the alternatives to traditional forms of measurement of growth like the GDP? Um, and lastly, what in your opinion and experience are some policy options to tackle inequality? Uh, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much uh, to Oxfam for inviting me to this uh, panel. Um, and thanks, Mira, for outlining the questions. Um, I also want to thank uh, Wu Chang for inviting CSOs to be ambitious, bold, innovative, and challenge the status quo. So my presentation is a little different because um, I'm going to be, I think, not just addressing some of the symptoms of inequality, but some of the root causes. So uh, the presentation is entitled A World in Peril and Paralyzed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, which is actually a quote from uh, a recent speech made by Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And he basically, in his opening remarks, says, inequalities are actually exploding. Our planet is burning. People are hurting with the most vulnerable suffering the most. And yet we are gridlocked in colossal global dysfunction. The international community is not ready or willing to tackle the big dramatic challenges of our time, of our age. And then he goes on to talk about um, debt relief and he says lending criteria should go beyond gross domestic product and include all the dimensions of vulnerability that affect developing countries. So I wanted to set the stage with that and just point to these two things, inequalities and the need to go beyond GDP. Next slide, please. So, uh, and again, before answering, answering your questions, Mira, I wanted to just quickly go over what do we mean by inequality and what are its links to GDP? So the conventional and kind of the dry definition is difference in size, degree, and circumstance. And a lot of the times IFIs are concentrating on economic and social inequalities. And here, uh, I think the academic thinking is looking at an alternative, more nuanced def definition when we're looking at the unfair situation where some people get more opportunities, access to resources and opportunities, life, challenge, uh, life chances and favors. But more importantly are the effects. You end up with differences in access to resources, opportunities, the inability to survive or thrive, 
uh, there's difference in status, uh, self-worth. It leads to vulnerability uh, in terms of exploitation and violence, uh, and also disadvantaged position in terms of power and uh, decision-making and discrimination and, and injustices. Um, and so here, what uh, a lot of the academic thinking is pointing to is that actually GDP and inequality are completely inseparable. Um, and that GDP is an inadequate measure of progress, and it has led to the widening inequalities that we're talking about, including elite capture, and it makes poverty eradication quite uh, elusive, and that trickle-down economics just has not worked. Next slide, please. So, um, to, to answer your first question, the academic rethinking about inequality, I think, started a really long time ago including with Simon Kuznets, who was the inventor of GNP. Uh, and in 1934, he said, look, GNP as the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred uh, as a measure of national income. So he himself questioned uh, you know, GDP a very long time ago. And you also have this very famous speech by Robert Kennedy in 1966, three decades later, where he says gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our national wonder in chaotic sprawl. Yet GDP does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. These are very powerful words. Um, and you see just a few years later, the uh, fourth king of Bhutan during an interview with the Financial Times uh, as saying that gross national happiness that is well-being, is more important than uh, GNP. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, when we think about inequality, I, I think, um, you know, just linking um, uh, inequality to GDP again, there's the conventional thinking about progress, which really narrowly focuses on income and productive output. So you have things like the Gini coefficient or GDP, uh, but most importantly, I think, is GDP per GDP per capita, which is actually the foundational logic for the IFIs. Um, so you have this kind of linear model that's set up where certain countries have to catch up to others. And so the entire world is divided into HICS, MIX, and LDCs. Uh, and, and so that you know, kind of creates a, a kind of unequal world, um, purely based on GDP. And so what uh, academics have been arguing is that there are fatal flaws in GDP that have led to the current inequalities that we're discussing here today. So if you imagine that um, GDP is this big calculator with this really huge productive sign, so you, it just keeps adding uh, market transactions one after the other, but there's no minus sign. So you can't subtract things like carbon emissions or environmental degradation or cultural loss or loss of indigenous knowledge. And there's no way to describe what is being produced. It externalizes environment, social, cultural, and other costs, so it's a misleading uh, indicator. It fails to count informal activities like women's unpaid work, nor does it describe the quality of labor uh, or the the income distribution, which is what we're talking about. It, it does not describe uh, inequalities or disparities. And so uh, in the Oxfam report, you know, there was this discussion about the billionaire variant, which I think both the speakers have spoken about as well, the, the ability for billionaires to capture um, a lot of the wealth in the concentrated hands of a few. It also assumes that Earth has finite, infinite resources to be extracted, exploited, and polluted, and it has a narrow focus on the country's financial and material wealth, and does not measure or value qualitative elements, things like indigenous uh, knowledge or culture, for instance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So I think also when we are thinking about inequality, we might want to expand the definition beyond conventional thinking. That is the three pillars of, of the SDGs, economic, social, environment, and think about uh, cultural inequality, climate inequality, political inequality, development inequality, post-colonial inequality. And I think it's been mentioned that wealth inequality should also be uh, you know, uh, included in, in, when, in the ways that we think about inequality. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, this is a really ambitious thing to do is to try and summarize, you know, all of academic rethinking about inequality. And I just want to uh, just highlight a few uh, kind of um, landmark uh, bodies of work. Uh, first of all, uh, there would be the Stiglitz report. Um, around 2008, also referred as a Sarkozy report, which basically outlines uh, GDP's limitations, it, that it's an inadequate measure of social and economic progress. Uh, it, it has all these exclusions that I talked about earlier, and we need to move from GDP to a more holistic measure, which is well-being. And this has been argued by Nobel Prize winning economists. Um, then you also have the landmark work by Thomas Piketty, um, Capital in the 21st Century, which actually, you know, uh, outlines distribution of inequality, especially in North America and Europe, and it just talks about the concentration of wealth due to capitalism and that capture of wealth in the hands of 1%, that elite capture, which has led to widening inequalities. And this very much mirrors the work of Oxfam, especially when we look at Asia, you, you see exactly the same patterns. Um, and then also uh, you see Jason Hickel's work in the book called The Divide, where you see a history of global inequality and that actually his uh, work is quite, um, I would say, uh, provocative, where he says, actually, if you look at the resource and capital outflows from the South, um, they, you know, they far outweigh the amount of aid that is poured into the South from the North. And uh, he talks about the history, historical legacy of structural ad adjustment programs um, and, and just shows that actually a lot of labor and capital has been captured by the North and that it, the, you know, the world exists in an e unequal terms and the South has not been able to shake off this massive debt that it's accumulated um, that, the, that the speaker before has also uh, talked about. Um, there's also social justice movements that I think that are really Im important that encourage us to reimagine and construct society and the world as it's managed in a very different form. And here, the, the, the groundbreaking book by David Graeber and David Wengro, The Dawn of Everything, I think is a must read, uh, and it really challenges our, our assumptions. Um, there's a lot of uh, movements like the degrowth movement, which critiques GDP and growth and uh, encourages us to reduce global consumption and production. So this goes against that logic about growth and GDP. And, and it says that actually GDP contradicts the global planetary boundaries. There's also other movements such as, you know, the ones that say nature has rights. So therefore you see in certain countries uh, where a river then gains legal status and it has voice and value. This goes beyond the human centric and allows us to make sure that uh, we don't pollute uh, natural resources like rivers. The next slide, please. So how can uh, rethinking provide a critical view of IFI's approaches to inequality? The first thing I think is to break this addiction to GDP. Uh, it has led to global climate and planetary crisis, poverty persists and inequalities have widened. And it's important to internalize this rethinking about uh, moving beyond GDP and looking at alternative models. For instance, the World Bank, you know, started to think about this a few years ago and has published a little bit about this. Um, I think it would be important for the regional IFIs to also incorporate some of this thinking. I think the conceptualization and the very framing of the way we think development needs to change. I know that's a very big uh, statement, 
Uh, but it can be done in ways such as including more dis inter, uh, transdisciplinarity. So I know a lot of the IFIs are dominated by economists or engineers or technical experts and have a really big focus on infrastructure. Um, but I think it would be important to include um, other, tra uh, other disciplines and um, also to have a move towards qualitative uh, approaches. So not just numbers, but also people's experiences. What, is, what are the stories of inequality, how is it actually lived? Uh, and I think focusing on experience would be important. Overdevelopment, overconsumption, moving beyond the dirty development model, uh, moving beyond coal, which I think the ADB has already done, but also to maybe rethink supporting projects that support fossil fuels. Um, I think Vanuatu has been very vocal about this recently. Uh, I mean, I think being open to dialogue and critical thinking, such as this panel, I think should be commended. And then I think going beyond gender mainstreaming. Um, so uh, I know there's been some really good work about documenting women's unpaid care work, but I think that locates women's work really in the household. And we have to think about both women and men's unpaid work in terms of livelihoods income, as well as their community work, including conserving the environment. Um, I think develop, developing member countries and internet, um, indigenous peoples can lead the way. There are incredibly great alternatives from Bhutan, Vanuatu, and in Indonesia that can show us the way. Next slide, please. So what are the alternatives, Mira, you asked about uh, conventional measurement to, to uh, things like growth and GDP? So first I'd like to say that if we think about these alternatives in a spectrum, we start with some that look like alternatives, but they're actually non or false alternatives because they're still very much entrenched in the GDP growth uh, economic centric model, like the World Happiness Report. Next slide, please. Okay, and then there are other alternatives that argue for slowing down of GDP, like degrowth or donut economics or the circular economy, or some that work in tandem with GDP, like the wealth index that the World Bank is uh, producing, or the Happy Planet Index, or the Living Planet Index, which tries to focus more on environmental issues, but still is entrenched kind of in GDP. Then there's ones that complement GDP. And what they do is they try to incorporate um, more indigenous perspectives and culture, like uh, the one from New Zealand, uh, and then there are ones that move beyond GDP, and some of them are moral concepts, such as Buen Vivir from Ecuador or Bolivia or Ubuntu from South Africa, or ones that are moral concepts but also measure uh, well-being, such as gross national happiness from Bhutan or the nas uh, national uh, uh, progress framework in Scotland. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, what are the policy options to tackle inequality here? I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to borrow some of Albert's time because he was under time. I think there are urgent shifts required. Um, moving beyond GDP approaches are very important. Alternatives like degrowth, universal basic income, gross national happiness are ones. Loss and damage, I think, is a really important issue where countries who've contributed to climate change compensate countries that have done actually nothing to contribute to climate change. Uh, the global tax on wealthy and the windfall tax has been argued by many uh, academics. Uh, the accountability of, uh, accountability of transnational corporations, labor codes, and to close loopholes uh, for wealth extraction is, is very important. Um, there are arguments around colonial reparations that are gaining ground in academia as well in social movements. Debt relief for the middle income countries and the LDCs that the Secretary General himself has mentioned. Uh, there are some calls for IFI reform to have greater accountability and democratization uh, that are also being discussed. Uh, tackling patriarchy, racism, disability, and other forms of discrimination is another one. Social protection has been discussed at length by the previous speakers. And I think the CSO work on moving beyond GDP has been instrumental. And here I really want to commend Oxfam on its reports on inequality, which have been invaluable to the um, academics around the world. Next slide. It's just my last slide. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to leave with a, a quote by David Graeber. The ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make.
and could just as easily make differently. And I'd like to end here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritu, for that excellent uh, analysis. Uh, academia does essentially hold up a mirror to policymakers and practitioners and helps us not to lose sight of the bigger picture. So thank you for sharing some of the imaginations and reconceptualization of inequality. Lots of good ideas there. Um, so from the panel overall, I'm getting the sense that there are structural systems of expression and exploitation in place to create inequality. Uh, to develop progressive policies, we need to understand that as much of a daunting challenge it seems, the structures can be undone. But we need a solid commitment from those in positions of power. Oxfam works with multiple stakeholders for closing the gap between the rich and the poor, from for universal access to health and education, for fairer taxation, and lastly, for more human economic models that put people and planet into it. On that note, I would like to open the floor for any Question. I see that we have a few in already, and I will proceed with um, asking those. So uh, the one that's more voted, and I think that's because of the uh, of the situation in Philippines today. Um, I will start with asking that so, uh, Philippines just suffered from a super typhoon, which seemingly caught many by surprise. Can the panel comment on how the speed of these extreme weather events? Events is more disadvantages for the, I would say, for vulnerable populations, maybe because the question completed. Any thoughts on that? And maybe I'll ask the next one with it as well, because these are both about disasters. Um, uh, the next one is that are suffering from, a from the effects of climate change in the form of the most devastating floods in history. How can other countries help, especially at a time of do donor fatigue? I feel these both are connected, so maybe if you could, uh, if you would would like to answer these. Um, Albert, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it, it's a complicated answer. I, you know, we, we have the disaster, the typhoon here in the Philippines, but we have the huge historic floods this year in, uh, in Pakistan. And then earlier in Bangladesh, we have historic droughts in China and in India. So clearly climate change is creating more extreme weather events. And it creates a lots of challenges. Um, I think one thing, uh, of course, what, what individuals can do, of course, is to try to provide relief support. That's the first thing that has to happen is just to protect the vulnerable right away who may be suffering from extreme hardships. Uh, but beyond that, I think there needs to be thought about creating more resilient systems. So advanced information warning systems of various types of disasters using the most update information and technologies can ha have a huge benefit for helping people have a little bit more time to prepare and for governments as well. Um, second is we have to build resilience into our infrastructure and even the, the type of agriculture we do. Um, so anticipating that uh, you know the weather is going to become more unstable and we have to start these investments into climate adaptation. And so there, those are all different ways I think we that uh, we have to make progress in addressing uh, these types of natural disasters. And Asia is really where uh, populations are most vulnerable. You have lots of the population living on, in coastal areas and the frequency of uh, uh, disasters is the highest. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Riti, would you like to comment on these? On the increasing catastrophes and how we can respond to them. Yeah. Sure. Well, here's the thing. You can have a disaster or a climate related disaster and your GDP might go up because of the amount you spend to uh, help people uh, and the, to clean up the disaster. Um, and so this goes back to GDP. It excludes, it does not count the cost of environmental destruction. And so that's a fundamental flaw. So the first thing I think is we have to have a different measure, a different indicator of progress that actually includes environmental costs, number one. And number two, I'd like to suggest, I, I talked about this really briefly, is loss and damage. I think it's really important that uh, countries that have not contributed to climate change um, you know, do get compensation for the countries that have overconsumed and uh, have really uh, uh, contributed to climate change. So loss and damage and a better measure that actually includes environmental degradation. Those would be the two things uh, that I would say.
Thank you. Thank you. So Matthew, would you like to comment uh, on this? Sure. I mean, I want to look at these events from the point of view of inequality. And I think that um, natural disasters always dramatically increase inequality. Let's not forget that natural disasters in terms of climate change, there's a lot of very good work out there, notably for the World Inequality Lab, talking about how it's the wealthy, both globally and within countries, who are producing the almost all the emissions and yet the people who suffer from the natural disasters when they happen are almost invariably the poorest citizens um, and then in particular what we need to do about that well we need a much more comprehensive and fast acting system of social protection in countries uh, most countries are really still terrible at responding to disasters um, in, a, in a rapid and comprehensive way. But also we shouldn't forget that people who are hit by these types of disasters tend to suffer very badly in terms of losing education and losing health care during this period too. Uh, and, you know, I, I agree with what the colleague said uh, totally about, about more resilience, but also about different ways of measuring things. I, I remember um, working with the Morales government in, in Bolivia when it came to power to look at how one could factor precisely those types of uh, environmental but also uh, natural disasters in their case growing drought in the altiplano into uh, the whole measurement of what it was causing inequality and what to do about it and I, I do think we need to take this much more seriously going forward thank you so much there's another connected question so i'll ask that first albert maybe you are in a better position to answer this um adp president massa talked about drm is it a relevant regional financing tool to reduce inequality at the regional scale instead of a piecemeal country specific approach how impactful would that be drm is domestic resource mobilization and um uh Earlier uh, this uh, year, our Asian Development Outlook Report had a theme chapter really focused on tax mobilization. And uh, one of the contexts is that, you know, many governments have actually spent pretty aggressively in response to the pandemic to deal with all of the vulnerabilities. Um, not that they did a perfect job, but they definitely uh, spent beyond uh, their usual kind of budgetary limits. And as a result, debt levels have increased, and that's why we have these concerns of uh, the, the uh, many governments are going to uh, kind of run out of the this, this space to keep spending. And one way to relieve that pressure, um, to be able to continue supporting vulnerable groups and also to finance other investments needed to make progress toward the SDGs, is to try to raise uh, taxes. And so I think generally there's scope to do that. Asia's tax as a share of GDP is still much lower than other regions. But of course, how do you do that? And what types of taxes? And uh, I think there's, of course, a preference to do it in a progressive fashion as much as possible. Um, and to the extent that, you know, political um, circumstance makes, uh, makes, makes feasible. Uh, but there's also issues about capabilities of the system, as I mentioned earlier, to process the information, to implement different types of taxes. And there's also, of course, the incentive issues about whether it's going to reduce um, uh, the incentives of people to invest or to work hard. Uh, and I know growth has kind of gotten a dirty name in this uh, panel, but uh, I think um, growth is still an important part of uh, development strategy and a poverty reduction strategy and has been really important for uh, reducing poverty in many of our, our economies. Um, and so I think... Um, we want to just make growth as, as inclusive as possible um, and also recognize, of course, all of the other um, effects that are occurring. And I think some of the ideas about incorporating natural capital into GDP measures to at least capture better the environmental damage of, uh, of, of, uh, that occurs um, as, uh, along with the process of growth are really actually important and should be given high priority. Thank you so much. I think the next uh, would, uh, yeah. So the next question is, I think, more of a comment, but I'll just read it out quickly. Um, short-term programs to alleviate extreme poverty are just that. Impacts are short-term. 
what are needed are long lasting solutions that can be generational uh, real education scholarship work opportunities for uh, vulnerable people i think we do agree with that and we have talked about that quite extensively on uh, longer term solutions um the next question is in this discussion on inequality uh, policies and plans are we referring to inequity also how do we distinguish between inequality and inequity programs to address these matthew i think i'll start with you on this uh, in line with the cri index maybe you can comment on inequality versus inequity inequity on it and then i can move on to the other panelists thank you I'm not sure I actually know what the difference between the two is. Um, I, I want to just before, before going on to that to come to come back on the DRM issue because I think this is absolutely yeah. fundamental uh, for okay. Asia's uh, own independence from uh, borrowing from international capital markets and getting into a, a negative debt cycle, which which it's in at the moment. Um, what strikes me about progressive taxation, and I remember a very good study by UNDP a few years ago where they they interviewed policymakers across the world and said the policymakers found progressive taxation, the most difficult policy to introduce because of the opposition, principally of wealthy people and of uh, elites. But what there's been since then is a huge amount of analysis of public opinion across the world showing, and it's no different in Asia from anywhere else in the world, that about between two thirds and three quarters of citizens in most countries do not think that their current tax system is progressive enough, i.e. that the rich are bearing a fair share of the burden and want it to be more progressive. So the question really is then, why is, is that not happening? Um, and the answer is, as, as Rita was talking about in, in her presentation briefly, the, the, the imbalance of power, that, those, that the people who don't want that to happen have access to uh, policymakers to, to stop it from happening much more than, than ordinary people do. And I, what I really want to uh, push back against though, is the idea that making tax policies more progressive in Asia would uh, somehow discourage incentives. Um, there is virtually no evidence to support that. Even, even the, um, the most ardent advocate of reducing taxes, um, Mr. Laffer, with the famous Laffer curve, did not suggest that uh, there was a disincentive from high tax levels until you got up to tax rates of uh, in excess of 40 to 50 percent, which m almost every Asian country is way, way from having, uh, particularly if one looks at effective tax rates, i.e. how much is collected of people's income and takes into account all the uh, evasion and avoidance that goes on and the incentives and, and uh, exemptions that are given to people. So I, I just want to really underline this emphasis between uh, this emphasis, the need for emphasis on um, DRM in country uh, development policies because it's the most uh, easiest way for countries to have their own um, their own independent development policy which they can fund for themselves and not be dependent on the inequity of international markets and as we see at the moment the volatility of international markets including uh, with the rise in global interest rates. Um, just, I mean, equity, inequity and inequality, um, I suppose inequity is about, partly about the sort of inequity of treatment and fairness and justice. Um, and for me, uh, the, the issue of inequality, whether measured by income or by some of the uh, excellent concepts that Ritu was talking about, uh, is absolutely vital to overcut to ensuring fair and impartial treatment as well. Uh, if a government has a concept that its citizens should be treated fairly and impartially, it's much more likely to take policies which reduce inequality uh, and which bring justice to people. But the types of policies I've talked about, and we, we say this very clearly in the CRI report, are by no means the only ones you need to take to deal with justice and fairness issues. Uh, there are lots of policies that need to be taken to deal with racial injustice, caste injustice, gender injustice, which have to do with establishing and, and enforcing rights for people that go way beyond what impacts on their income and wealth. Thank you uh, so much. Dr. Ritu, would you like to comment on inequality versus inequity and what would be some of the programs and policies focusing on inequity in particular? Sure. Um, so actually, I wanted to include this in my slide, but with the 15 minute mark, <laughs> I had to get rid of it. I think when we look at uh, equality, 
we're what we're seeing is that uh, what we're saying is that you know if you remove all the barriers, uh, like for instance, what growth argues that if you have a free market, then everybody has an equal chance, right? Whereas in equity, it's a slightly different approach. What we're saying is you actually have to take into the realities, the histories, and um, the power relations. Because just by freeing a market economy doesn't mean you're going to lead to poverty reduction and inequality, because there are structural conditions, historical conditions that don't really allow, um, for instance, um, you know, if we're looking at, you know, LDC, MIC or HIC status, or you're looking at vulnerable uh, populations within countries, you know, billionaires have captured all this wealth. Uh, and what does this mean for, you know, the most porous and vulnerable people? Um, and it means that, you know, you actually need policies. Um, um, you need uh, interventions uh, and you need things to, e even after a free economy, to support, to further support uh, people to tackle those barriers. To me, that's the difference. And in terms of solutions, um, I've talked a lot about, uh, you know, uh, having more inclusive indicators uh, that take into account um, notions of well-being. Uh, I've talked about loss and damage. Uh, also talked about uh, fossil fuel uh, divestment. I think Vanuatu is leading the charge. And I'd like to say that, you know, within Asia Pacific, there's already so many alternatives and solutions. So we just have to look within the region and find that people are already working on it. Uh, in the Pacific Islands, you know, uh, climate change is a, is a reality. Um, you're seeing sea level rise, uh, existential, uh, existential uh, threats to the actual uh, sovereignty and the continuation of certain nation states. Uh, and so I think um, uh, they need support uh, beyond, you know, a, a free market. L last solution, debt relief. Uh, I think uh, we have to take into account that I'm not sure taxation will totally resolve uh, the historical um, records, uh, the historical injustices. So I think it's really important to have debt relief and writing off debts of some of these countries so that they don't have to revert to austerity measures. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. We have we are actually short on time, which is why we can't ask uh, all of the questions. There's some really thought provoking ones, especially one on degrowth that I would have really loved to ask. But we are short on time, and I would really like to thank our wonderful participants for those really challenging questions, um, and thank you to our panelists for those insightful responses. Um, in the end, I would now like to invite Maria Rosario Felisco, uh, who is the country director at the o Oxfam in the Philippines, uh, to deliver the closing remarks and really tie in all of the amazing discussion we had we had today. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you. We were just starting to have a very interesting discussion, and I'm almost uh, sad to have to. Uh, draw it to a close, but uh, given our time, allow me to deliver brief uh, closing remarks. First of all, thank you very much to Wu Chung for setting the tone for this session that kicks off the civil society segment of the 55th annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank, for speaking very, in a very inspiring fashion about how our relationship as civil society and ADB can evolve into becoming effective partners for inclusive development. Our panelists provided us with very rich insights, starting off with Matthew's presentation on how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and increased existing inequalities, elaborated on by Albert, and further interrogated in a very exciting way by Ritu. Indeed, COVID has affected everyone, but its impact has been unequal. The poorest people, women, and other vulnerable groups have taken the heaviest blunt. Poor people's income has fallen sharply during the pandemic and without accelerated efforts to combat this inequality, the sustainable development goals to end extreme poverty and reducing inequality will not be met in Asia by the deadline of 2030. The pandemic should have been a wake-up call to introduce policies to tackle inequality aggressively, but as Matthew shared, most governments have continued with business as usual. But there are also governments that have shown that even in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, strong policy actions 
could be taken to fight inequality. And I would really invite you all to read the report from Oxfam and Development Finance International to see how governments have demonstrated that inequality is a policy choice, ranging from how Vietnam has sustained investment in public health to how Thailand has made considerable progress since committing to universal health coverage. And in the Philippines, how care work has been featured in, in local legislation. But clearly, governments can do more. Matthew has already spoken about the need to produce national inequality reduction action plans to tackle inequality in the post-COVID world. This could mean increasing anti-inequality spending, making tax more progressive, and increasing workers' rights and pay, investing much more in annually monitoring progress on reducing inequality and the impact of policies. We had a very rich discussion in the question and answer on tax, and I would just like to say that, as the report says, that this is in a time of economic crisis and economic solidarity. And historically, this is the time and the moment when governments will find the most support to increase taxation of the wealthiest in order to support more uh, public, uh, more social protection policies. We know that taxing wealth is a vital tool, and it has already been. Uh, stated by the IMF, the UN, and the OECD that governments should be using taxes more progressively and more deliberately to fund support for citizens during and after the pandemic. Thank you also for introducing the, the topic of climate change because this provides an additional and more complex layer to inequality. Indeed, as we speak, uh, Super Typhoon uh, Noru has just um, impacted the Philippines and we know how extreme weather events induced by climate change make the poor suffer the worst and makes social protection and resilience programming even more important alongside global ne negotiations, including uh, the call for loss and damage. Thank you to Albert for affirming how ADB under its strategy 2030 aims to achieve prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. And, for Math and to Matthew for pointing out how ADB can more effectively tackle inequality by prioritizing this in more clearly in the agendas of its key decision-making meetings, by developing an action plan to set clear targets, by supporting governments in bridging the financing gap, and establishing a robust mechanism to support and monitor the achievements on inequality. The world was extremely unequal before the pandemic, and it is even more unequal now. Unless urgent action is taken by governments and the international community, the profound increase in inequality driven by COVID-19 will rapidly become permanent, and governments will lose a decade in fighting it. None of this is inevitable. Inequality, as has been stressed in the last hour, is a policy choice. Even in the midst of multiple crises, some governments are actually showing that another way is possible, that the road to greater equality is a practical alternative journey that can be taken by all nations and never has taken this road being more urgent. On that note, I would like to thank you all for a very fruitful and very exciting morning of exchanging ideas. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Rosario, for summing up the conversation and giving us perspective as well. Uh, just lastly, very quickly, we would like to display the graphic summary of the discussion today developed by Desiree Day from Tofu Creatives. Hi, Desiree. There. OK, hi, everyone. Here's a quick visual journey of today's session. So uh, Mr. Wu Chung started by saying that the role of civil society, it's really important to continue asking difficult questions, challenging the status quo, and the past 20 years has been a story of increasing collaboration. And then Mr. Matthew discussed the key messages, uh, which indicated that COVID exacerbated Asia's 
inequality crisis, but it's also possible to fight the inequality via equitable public services, progressive taxation, and enhanced labor rights. And some of the recommendations include for governments, national inequality reduction plans, um, use the use of progressive taxation for ADB to prioritize tackling inequality, bridging the financing gap, and for the international community, enhance global monitoring of SDG 10. And over to Mr. Albert Park, who discussed and emphasized the priorities on strengthening social protection, um, remediate effects of learning loss and unemployment, promoting inclusive digitalization, and reducing inequality of opportunity. And he outlined all the programs and projects that ADB has on these. And Dr. Ritu discussed the rethinking of uh, GDP, and this includes breaking our addiction to it, uh, having an open dialogue, um, and some of the alternatives include the slowdown, having like a circular economy, also in tandem, but also moving beyond this concept. And then some of the policy options include um, the global tax on the wealthy, debt relief, loss and damage, and tackling discrimination, which were also discussed in the panel. And some of the points during the panel discussion uh, were building resilient systems, uh, making growth as inclusive as impossible, and measuring having a better measure that includes environmental degradation. And lastly, for the closing, uh, the message that inequality is a policy choice and it's important to have urgent action and collaboration. Thank you everyone for letting us draw the big picture with all of you. Thank you so much, Desiree, for that really creative visualization and a very nice summary of all the discussion we had today. Um, once again, thank you to our panelists for participating in the panel today, and thank you to our participants for really listening in and driving the discussion. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you all have a lovely day and are able to participate in the other annual general meeting events as well. Thank you. <laughs>